Uh, next, we have our own Tony Fincham, who really is a real live person. Here he comes. Uh, Tony, a somewhat ancient GP from South East Kent, he describes himself. And longtime THS member, has been exploring Thomas Hardy's Wessex for over 45 years. Mm -hmm. He's published three monographs on Hardy. Hardy the Physician, which is an excellent book, I have to say. Hardy's Wessex Revisited and Exploring Thomas Hardy's Wessex. Uh, many of you will know uh, Tony as having been our chairman for quite a long period. And in that time, he has led a number of walks for us. He is the preeminent topographer of Hardy's works to date. And he will be speaking to you on Tessa's track. The Perambulations of a Pure Woman. Here's Tony. In the mid-1980s, in preparation for the first Wessex edition of the novels, Hardy marked salient features in red crayons on copies of Crutchley's ra Railway and Telegraphic Maps, published between 1856 and 1882. Um, his copies for Hampshire, Berkshire, Devon and Somerset are held in the British Library. And, in fact, if you go there, you have to get special permission, put white gloves on, etc., to see them. Um, his map of Dorset uh, didn't get to the British Library. It was kept in the DCM, but it went missing for a long time. And, in fact, at the stage I was writing my original landscape book, no one knew where it was or no one had seen it. Then, about five years ago, it mysteriously reappeared. And on this map, Hardy has... These are Hardy's inscriptions. Um, and this, this is one which you see. It says, Tess is wandering, so shown in red lines. And then there's a second inscription, just reconfirming that in Hardy's writing. The red lines show Tess's tracks. Now, this map, unlike his other ones, only deals with one character, which is Tess of the D'Urbervilles. His other, his other maps show all the relevant bits of fiction related to those areas. Now, um, th this, this is a picture of the original map. As, as you can see, I'm, I'm sorry that it's, it's, particularly for those at the back, it's not terribly clear, but the lines are not terribly well recorded anyway. I mean, h here, are these, here are these red lines, which actually don't really follow existing roads or tracks. He's just got A to B and drawn a straight line across the map and not worried about the geography. Um, this is an enhanced version um, which somebody at the DCM has produced, or the DM, we better call it now, has produced. It also, this also includes additional red lines um, going from uh, Plush to uh, Bridport, th this one here, and then back again, which are not on Hardy's original map. And I think don't forget that the horizons and landscapes of a partly real, partly dream country, as Hardy said in his preface to Far From the Madding Crowd. Um, the next slide, forgive me for, but I gave a talk uh, several years ago to some people who were interested in topography but didn't know much about Hardy. And in case you've forgotten, uh, this is a very brief summary of the plot of Tess of the D'Urbervilles. Uh, his, she's the daughter of a heavy-drinking haggler in Marlott, which is Marnell. She kills the family horse in a nocturnal road traffic collision. <laughs> in recompense, she is sent to claim kin with the nouveau riche D'Urbervilles at Boveridge. Alec, the villainous son of the household, is enchanted by her and rapes her in Cranbourne Chase. Back at home, she gives birth to Sorrow, who dies in infancy. Tess goes to work as a milkmaid in the Valley of the Great Dairies, uh, just south of Piddletown. Here, Tess and Angel Clare, a parson's son, fall in love and marry. On their wedding night, she confesses to her past and he deserts her. Remember, this was written for people who didn't know much about Hardy. Desolate, forsaken Tess works sweet hacking at Flint Camash, which is plush. She meets up again with Alec D'Urberville, disguised as a Methodist ranter. Alec abandons religion for Tess. They settle in Sandbourne, which is Bournemouth. Angel returns from Brazil. Tess murders Alec and flees with Angel into the New Forest. Arrested while sleeping at Stonehenge, Tess is hanged in Winchester Jail. Angel goes off with Liza Lou, Tess's younger sister. And this is the story of a pure woman faithfully presented by Thomas Hardy. And similarly, I'm just going to done a, I've done a summary of Tess's walks, and these are all the journeys that she makes in the novel. The first one is with Abraham. They set out to take the beehives from Marlott to Casterbridge, and unfortunately, this results in the death of Prince. Her next 
journey is from Marlott to Trantridge. They walk to Shaston, which is Shaftesbury, and then she takes the carrier's van to Trantridge Cross and walks the chase and the slopes and comes back adorned with strawberries and roses. The next repeat of the same journey, really, Marlott to the slopes. As you remember, Alec picks her up in her gig. He tries to frighten her in Melbury down near Wind Green. She gets out and walks. Subsequently, she goes to Chaseborough, and then Alec le- rides, she rides with Alec back into the chase. She then returns um, uphill towards Shaston to get back to Marlott after she's left Alex. And then in phase the third, on a time-scented bird-hatching morning in May, she takes a hard trap to Starcastle, gets a lift in a farmer's cart to Weatherbury, and goes across Egdon to Rainbarrow and on to Torbethay's farm. From Torbethay, she goes to Melstock Church, uh, which is the episode where um, Alex carries the milkmaids across the flooded lane, and then she goes to Morton with the milk pails. Honeymoon journey to Wellbridge. Alex sleep, Angel sorry, carries her to the mill. And then there's a separation drive, Torbethys, then Weatherbury, Stagbrook Lane, past Nuttlebury. Angel leaves, Tess is dropped by fly just outside Marlott. God's in his heaven, all is not well with the world. Uh, her next journey is not detailed in the text, where she moves to the west of Dorset to near Port Breedy. From the west of the River Bridge, she goes via Chalk Newton and spends a night in the wood, ending up at Flintcomb Ash. From Flint Camas, she goes to Emminster, our high story ever shot in Benville Lane and back. This is her journey to try and get help from Angel's parents. She then eventually leaves Flint Camas and goes to Marlott. And then eventually the whole family go to Kingsbeer sub Greenhill um, to uh, try and find their ancestral plot. And then, from, and then we, she reappears in Sandbourne. And she joins Angel and goes across the great forest to Bramshurst Court, which is where they spend a few nights. From there, they go via Melchester, which is Salisbury, to Stonehenge. And then justice is done, and the presence of the immortals in East Galean phase has ended his sport with Tess. So I'm just going to go through these different journeys in detail. Um, this is a map of Marlott, or Marnell, in the time of the D'Urbervilles. And this Barton cottage is thought to be Tess's cottage. The re, they, so they lived at the southern end of um, uh, Marlott, which is called Walton Elm. The reason this is thought to be her cottage is because Hardy is believed to have visited there in the 1920s and said, this is where I put my Tess. And this is on the testimony of one person he spoke to at the time. So there is some doubt about that. Um, the other things we can see here, here is the site of the club dancing, the lamb here, which used to be a pub, is thought to be the site of Rolliver's. Up the other end of the town is the crown of the village. It's a big village. This is one of the biggest villages in Dorset. Up the other end is the crown, which is referred to as the, as the pure drop. And they sometimes like to claim that they're Rolliver's, but there's not much evidence for that. Um, moving on, this is Tess's Cottage as it stands today, and that's an old brewery in the background. Um, and... There, is a pu- there was a public right-of-way right up here, straight past the cottage, which fits with some of the incidents, like when Alec rides his horse up to the cottage. But a few years ago, and the Hardy Society was involved with this, they had the path diverted. And these days, you go over the hedge somewhere back here and walk up the field. But when the hedge is cut, as it is in this picture, you still get a fairly good view. And that's just... It's, it's quite a nice, substantial cottage. Now, Tess is first recorded journey, and this is using Hardy's map, was with Abraham to Casterbridge Saturday Market. When they passed the little town of Star Castle, and Star, so, so Star Castle is Sturminster Newton, um, so it doesn't really show very well on this. The one thing Hardy has mentioned, uh, marked, is Bullbar, and these are Hardy's little marks on the map. Um, when they passed the little town of Star Castle, they reached high ground, still higher on their left, the elevation called Bullbarrow or Bealbarrow, well nigh to the highest point in South Wessex, swelled up into the sky. And, and this is uh, Bullbarrow, which at 902 feet above sea level is the third highest point in Dorset. And this is the graphic illustration. In stagnant darkness, they waded through an interval which seemed endless. 18th of July. Then Tess subsequently 
sets out to claim tin, kin. She walks to Shaston, then takes the carrier's van to Trenchage Cross, then walked to the chase and the slopes, and, and the same in reverse when she came back, as we already said, adorned with roses, her bar- basket laden with strawberries. Now, this is a detail from Hardy's map. In chapter 7, she walks with her mother and younger siblings from Marlott towards Shaston, which is Shaftesbury, when a handsome, horsey young back, buck picks her up in a spick-and-span gig and proceeds to terrify her by driving at breakneck speed down what he describes as one of the highest points in the county, requesting one little kiss on those homebrew lips to slow down. Tess refuses, allows her hat to be blown off on the road, and once allowed she refuses to mount beside him again. Hardy's Dorset map confirms the general direction of Alex's journey with Tess on that June day. But as I've already said, his drawings on the map are not very precise. And uh, Marnell's here, Sturmitz and Newton's there, Shaftesbury. And then we, we divert quite a way here into Wiltshire before coming back down. Uh, th- th- this is a map in some ways which makes it a, a little bit um, easier to see. Um, and on, on this, well, I shall read a bit first in there too. Dennis K. Robinson, whose Hardy's Wessex reappraised in 1972, remains the near definitive guide to Hardy's Wessex, attempted to confirm his identification of Trantridge with Pentridge by following Tess on her two journeys to the slopes and back, but he had to admit defeat. There is, however, no doubt the incline down which Durbeville had driven her so wildly was the road leading into the chase from Wind Green which descends over 600 feet to Tollard Royal and beyond. It's not entirely straight because it skirts around the boundaries of the Rushmore Estate and the adjoining Lama Tree Gardens, which is Hardy, where Hardy later danced on the greensward with Agnes Grove. So Lama Tree Gardens marked there. This is the road coming down here, which goes steeply downhill. This is just showing you Wind Green, which at 910 feet above sea level is just in Wiltshire, but the adjoining highway forms the county boundary. And on clear days, the views are magnificent. The Isle of Wight can be seen to the southeast, the Jurassic Coast straight ahead, and Shaftesbury behind you. And th- this is the view. It wasn't a terribly clear day when I took this, unfortunately. Dennis K. Robinson's problems are caused by his perpetuation of Herman Lee's original error that Hardy had Pentridge in mind for Trantridge. Nobody has ever been able to identify a property matching the slopes at, tr- at, tr- at um, Pentridge. And if, you, if, you've, if you've been at Pentridge, just, it doesn't fit the description at all. Nor have they been able to match Hardy's descriptions of the journeys to and from Trantridge from the geography in the neighbourhood of Pentridge. And if we go back here, um, they come down here. That B I've marked is the site of Boveridge, where we think the house is. Pentridge is over here. Um, in particular, the junction which Hardy calls Trantridge Cross, which is generally identified as this intersection here, um, is situated on Hanley Down. It's a hill from which the roads all slope downhill. I'm sorry about all these details, but it's just trying to show how we got to this. And in the text, they, they all slip, slope uphill from the crossroads. To solve this conundrum, I return to an early authority called Windle. And Windle is, is a very good source of information about Hardy's um, topography. In 1902, he identified the hamlet of Boveridge as the place where George... Sorry, Georgie Crookhill lost his clothes in a few crusted characters, continuing that near here is a house which may be looked upon as corresponding in situation with that in which the Stoke Durbervilles lived. And on Hardy's original map of Wessex, he marked, and if you look at the map, these three places are marked in this uh, order. And if you go to the map, and I've circled them there, this is the Ordnance Survey two and a half inch map, the place which K, Dennis K. Robinson was calling Trantridge Cross is right up there. But here is Cranbourne. If you take this as Crantridge Cross and Boveridge as the site of um, the slopes, that, then it all, it all fits together. On Hardy's map, Tess, Tess's journey ends somewhere between Pan, T- Pentridge and Boveridge, which at this stage is called Bowridge on this map. And also, also interestingly, that's his 
X, but he had another X there, which has been rubbed out. <laughs> and I mean, they're both near Bowridge, but actually where Bowridge House is here. So it does look as if Hardy was well, well aware of that originally. Bovridge House is a 19th century brick-built mansion on the slopes above Cranbourne Village, and thus on the edge of Cranbourne Chase. It dates from the 1820s, but was extended and refurbished in the 1880s, when the original red brick, as described in test, was overlaid with yellow. And the red brick apparently is still under the yellow. When Tess first approaches the house, the, it, the text says the crimson brick lodge came first into sight up to its eaves in dense evergreens. And this is still the lodge to Bovridge House. Mrs. Durberville's seat, the slopes, was not a memorial house in the ordinary sense. It was more, far more, a country house built for enjoyment, pure and simple with not an acre of troublesome land attached to it beyond what was required for residential purposes and for a little fancy farm, kept in hand by the owner and tended by a bailiff. And this, this is a little map we had drawn up just to explain the difference between the, dis, the walk that Tess made from Bobridge House um, down to Cranbourne, and that does fit well with the text. Behind these woods extending over a large area is Cranbourne Chase. And this is just the pub in Cranbourne, or Chaseborough as it was. Um, Hardy gives a detailed description in Chapter 10 of Tessa Durbervilles of her journey to and from Chaseborough. And this was, is called the Fleur de Luce. Um, at the time of this photograph, it was called the Fleur de Lys. Unfortunately, um, about 15 years ago, this picture was taken about 15 years ago. Since then, it's been re renamed rather dully the Inn at Cranbourne. But it's the same, the building is still there. Um, and th th this, I'm sorry if I'm in the, in the way. Um, th th this is a picture just showing as you walk from Cranbourne towards um, Bobridge House, here is the slopes there and then Cranbourne Chase behind it. Um, far behind the corner of the house stretched the soft azure landscape of the chase, a truly venerable tract of forest land, one of the few remaining woodlands in England of undoubted primeval date, where druid druidical mistletoe was still found on aged oaks, and where enormous yew trees, not planted by the hand of man, grew as they had grown when they were pollarded for bows. And here... Why it was that upon this beautiful feminine tissue, sensitive as gossamer, there should be traced such a coarse pattern as it was doomed to receive? Why so often the coarse appropriates the finer thus? The wrong man, the woman. The wrong woman, the man. Many thousand years of analytical philosophy have failed to explain. And I think critical theory will fail also, but that's a personal opinion. <laughs> um, right, now we're back in um, Marlot, because uh, that's where... Uh, test returns and just already mentioned um, this is the crown inn which has a pure drop bar and claims to be Rolliver's but there's, uh, the evidence is very definite that Rolliver's is the place that used to be the, the um, lamb uh, this is St Gregory's Church Marlot and um, in that shabby corner and whoops it's jumped a bit sorry and here, here is a more modern test. In that shabby corner of God's allotment where he lets the nettles grow and where all unbaptized infants, notorious drunkards, suicides, and others of the conjectory damned are laid. At the foot of the grave, Tess put a bunch of flowers in a little jar of water. What matter was that, that on the outside of the jar, the eye of mere observation, the eye of mere observation noted the words, Keelwell's marmalade. Um, I can't say that that is the original <laughs> part. Right. We now move on to phase the third, the rally. And this is Hardy's, the detail from Hardy's map, um, just coming fr from uh, Marlott down to Torbethays. And it also marks here um, that this is eventually Wellbridge there. Uh, it's a bit easier to see it on a map like this. Um, Marnell, Sturminster, Newton. So Tess takes the, um, uh, the, the carrier's uh, van to Stourcastle, where she happens to, which is Sturminster, where she happens to meet a farmer who's going the right direction, and she takes the farmer's cart all the way down to Puddletown, and then she walks across the heath to Torbethay's farm, which is down here. And to, we're reenacting part of that um, on our walk tomorrow. 
So this is, this is just a sign at Puddletown. Um, the phase the third, the rally on a thyme-scented bird hatching morning in May. And it took her, t t Tess took sundry wrong turnings, and it was two hours ere she found herself on a summit commanding the long sought for Vale. And th this is a, a 19th century photograph of Rain Barrow with a look over, view over the Vale. And this is a more recent one. The Valley of the Great Dairies, the valley in which milk and butter grew to rankness, the verdant plain so well watered by the river Var or Froome. And um, the, the building that we believe, or well, I believe, and most a lot of people do, to be um, Torbethay is, is actually just out of the picture. It's Norris Mill, which is here. This is um, the Duck Dairy Farm, which was the original um, Traveller's Rest Inn. And uh, it was featured in the poem Weathers, amongst others. And it's also um, the site of um, the, the, the pub in um, The Return of the Native, The Quiet Woman Inn. Um, right. And this is Hardy's map again, magnified of this area. It, it's not terribly helpful because he sort of comes straight down and then stops uh, by the railway line. Um, and th this isn't, Rain Barrow is up here, and there's no doubt from the text that Tess goes to Wayne, Rain Barrow to look over the valley. Here's the Traveller's Rest, marked as the Traveller's Rest on this map, and Norris Mill Farm isn't marked, but it's about there. And wh one, one of the arguments, I think we've gone to Ordnance Survey, which is a bit clearer, and this is the overprinted map with hardy places on it, and one of, one of the arguments in favour of Torbothay's being Norris Mill is if you read the text... Um, Tess comes down from Rain Barrow into the valley and into the farmyard to get from uh, Norris Mill down to T Lower Lille Farm uh, you have to walk for uh, about a mile and a quarter across the water meadows and that doesn't really fit Torbethay's mark there is actually um, the house which um, was built for Hardy's siblings which is where they lived Evidence from Hardy himself is conflicting. He, firmed, he confirmed to Clive Holland that Windle, again in 1901, was correct in his statement that Norris Mill Farm, by situation and general character, has the best right to be considered as the original for Torbethays. Herman Lee, who, as I'm sure you know, worked with Hardy and then the, the Wessex, the subsequent Wessex edition, the, there's a, an extra volume which contains Herman Lee's photographs of Hardy's country. He said, the dairy house is drawn from no particular building, but it's typical of many dairies to occupy the Froome Valley. Significantly, no photograph is offered, and obviously Herman Lee was primarily a photographer. I mean, the other thing I would say on this, local knowledge, people in, in Bockhampton, Sinford Parish, have always believed that Norris Mill was the original for Torbethays. And I'm afraid this is the only photograph of, I've got of the original Norris Mill farm. Um, but Windle, even writing in 1901, lamented the sad alterations which had taken place at Norris Mill by the turn of the century. Neither here nor in the buildings at Lower Lule is it possible to match the farm where the milkmaid slept in the dormitory with Angel ensconced in the loft above. Norris Mill was also the dairy farm most familiar to Hardy because it was situated just one mile away from Hardy's cottage, straight down the track that ran behind his home. Um, and this, to show the, the counter-argument, this is the thatch barn at Lower Lule, obviously being very well maintained. And th th this is the place which was thought, certainly for a while, to be the site of um, Torbethay's. And here is the illustration from the graphic. Uh, August the 8th, Tess in Derriman Dick's Yard. Now, churches, I'm not going to go into long digression on this because the... Uh, different people have tried to identify the exact length of flooded lane over which Angel carried the milkmaids. Um, it leads into a parallel debate about where Tess and Angel were married. It is generally presumed that this is at West Stafford Church because this is the nearest church to Lower Lule, and because Hardy described it as having a louvered belfry. However, um, the text states they were obliged to drive because the church was a long way off. Elsewhere in the text, both Angel and Tess reveal themselves to be strong and experienced walkers. The church was, if it was West Stafford, it was not a long way off, so why are they obliged to drive? 
In any case, the parish church for Lowell Lule is West Knighton, not West Stafford. In fact, the reason they were obliged to drive is most likely because Hardy envisaged the farm being at Norris Mill, which is in Puddletown Parish, which is over three miles distance from the farm and does have a louvered belfry. And uh, this was their wedding venue. From here, they went uh, to Woolbridge Manor, for their honeymoon, Hardy also maps on more, more, there's some, some dispute about which station they took the milk churns to because of the mention of a Caroline Manor house, but it is thought that it probably is Morton. We've already heard a bit about um, Wellbridge Manor today, but it's once portion of a fine manure residence and seat of a Durbeville, but since its partial demolition, a farmhouse. And this has changed little since Hardy wrote about it. And in fact, as some of you may know, it was put on the market in 2019 for £950,000. And it was sold last year for more than £200,000, less than that. And this is actually a picture I took from the estate agent's brochure at the time. Um, the problem with it is it's a grade two star listed building, which means it's very difficult to alter anything. You can't put a garage up, you can't alter the walls and that sort of thing. So, so this, this is the dining room as it stood two years ago. And he found that the mouldy old habitation somewhat depressed his bride. And this is the estate agent's picture of the kitchen in 2019. <laughs> so, and if I went and looked around it, and um, the tenants, because it, 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 it belongs to the Drax family, or it did until they sold it, um, the tenants were, didn't want to move, and they kept telling me how mouldy it was and how damp it was, and how very close it was to the room and how the garden flooded. So it certainly wasn't a house for a hardy and enthusiast. And it, as some of you may know, in the 1970s, there was a hotel, and the bedrooms have still got numbers on the doors. And the other thing I think I'm allowed to say, as well as Tess and Alec, another famous couple took their honeymoon there, which was Mike Nixon and his wife. But um, I don't think that lasted much more than, <laughs> than Angel. And, uh, and Sorry, I said Tess and Alec, Angel and um, Tess. And in fact, the two pictures there, one of them has become virtually undecipherable, and I think it's been like that for quite a long time. But th th this is the better one, and um, this is the picture I took when I looked around the house. On the landing, Tess stopped and started. What's the matter, said he? Those horrid old woman, women, how they frightened me. As all visitors of the mansion are aware, these paintings represent women of middle age of a date some 200 years ago, whose liniments, once seen, can never be forgotten. So that they're still there. The other one, you can hardly see. It's just sort of brown splodge. But they're there. Uh, moving on from there, these are the ruins of Bindon Abbey, um, the mill which Angel went to study, and the tomb where he somnambulistically laid Tess to rest in fact, it's more than a mile away from um, uh, the Wellbridge Manor, but um, this is what we call Hardy's contracting kaleidoscope in this part real, part dream country. And uh, th th this, is, this is the grave. Uh, when the abbey uh, was, was demolished in 1539, much of the stone was transported to Weymouth for the building of Sandsfoot Castle. And Sandfoot's castle is Henry VIII's castle, as mentioned in The Well Beloved. And this is the illustration from the graph graphic. They reached the cloister graph where the, were the graves of the monks. Upon one of these graves, he carefully laid her down. Right. So we're back to the map, which doesn't show very well. Um, the next journey was, that, was, that, was that the separation journey. Uh, where um, t Angel eventually leaves near Nuttlebury, which is Hazelbury Bryan, and Tess is dropped off by fly just outside Marlott. Her next journey is really mentioned, not detailed in the text, is where she goes to the dairies um, just beyond Port Breedy. But um, in the enhanced map, which I'm not sure who did this, but somebody enhanced this in the museum, it does show that quite clearly. And th th this is her journey uh, there. And that it, that's the journey subsequently to Emminster. Um, right. And this, again, illustration from the graphic, uh, two weeks further on. Uh, sorry, that should say plantation. Uh, wherein she had taken shelter, ran down at this spot into a peak, which ended hitherward, outside the hedge being arable ground. Upon the trees, scores of pheasants lay about, their rich plumage dabbled in blood. 
Right, and you remember she, she got she gone into the wood because she was being chased by um, a man who turns out to be Farmer Groby. The next morning she reached Chalk Newton, which is Maid Newton, and breakfasted at an inn, and and that was the White House, which is White Horse, which is no longer a pub. Most authorities agree that Flintcomb Ash is based on plush, and this is the Brace of Pheasants, the pub there. At the entrance of the village was a cottage whose gable jutted out into the road, and before applying for a lodging, she stood under its shelter. The wall felt warm to her back and shoulders, and she found that immediately within the gable was the cottage fireplace, and this is, as it still stands to this day, unchanged. Uh, this is a picture of Flinkham Ash. There was no exaggeration in Marin's definition of Flinkham Ash Farm as a Starbaker place. The Swede field in which she and her companion was set hacking was a stretch of a hundred odd acres in one patch on the highest ground of the farm, arising above the stony lanches. Uh, and in fact, as we heard earlier, you've got the white of the sky and the brown of the fields. Um, this is Hardy's map showing Tess's walk from Flintcombe Ash to Beminster, and as I've indicated, he just tended to draw a straight line. Some of the way there he's following the road, but quite a lot of the way he, he just drawn a line, which it, 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 that, that's a little bit odd, because some of his other maps are much more accurate, but anyway. Um, and this, this is just from the overprinted Ordnance Survey map, which shows it a bit more clearly. Keeping the veil on her right, she steadily steered westward, passing above the Hintocks, crossing the high road from Sherton Abbas to Casterbridge, and skirting Dogbury Hill and High Stoy, with the dell between them called the Devil's Kitchen. And this is a fairly accurate um, demonstration of the route. And the Hardy Society, to my knowledge, has, has twice um, walked this route. The first time, John Pentney led a walk on the centenary, and this is one which I led uh, 10 years ago. And I can recognise Tony Daniels at the front there. <laughs> Not sure who the others are. Maybe some of you who are here. And this is just showing the route further on, um, along, along the road, uh, coming towards Evershot, past Cross in Hand and Batcombe. And th this is the view across um, Blackmore Vale from there. It was, a, it was a year ago, all but a day, that Claire had married Tess. In the time she reached the edge of the vast escarpment, below which stretched the loamy vale of Blackmore, now lying misty and still in the dawn. And th this is basically showing the onward route. And... As you will remember, she dipped down a hill by a transverse lane into the small town or village of Evershed, being now about halfway over the distance. And this is, well, they call it Thomas Histari's Hardy's Historic Acorn Inn, which is the Sowen Acorn, which is also mentioned in the group of noble dames in the first Countess of Wessex. Um, it, come, it features in that story too. She made a halt here and breakfasted a second time heartily enough, not at the Sour and Acorn, for she avoided inns, but at a cottage by the church. And here we have another test cottage. And the second half of her journey was through a more gentle country by way of Benville Lane. And here we are coming down there. This uh, road here, this is Toller Down. This is the countryside where the beginning of Far From the Madding Crowd is set. Uh, this is where Gabriel Oak... Um, had his sheep. And this is also Crimacroc Lane, um, referred to in the poem about I left my days leasing, leasing in Crimacroc Lane. Um, and then she comes to uh, Beminster, or Eminster, the square tower beneath which she knew that at that moment the vicar and his congregation were gathered had a severe look in her eye. She goes to the uh, vicarage but finds gets no reply, and this is the vicarage as it now stands. The shrubs on the vicarage lawn rustled uncomfortably in the frosty breeze. She, she goes back past the church. As she reached the churchyard gate, the people began pouring out, and Tess found herself in the midst of them. And this is Evershed. When she comes to Evershed on her return journey, it's deserted. The three o'clock sun shone full upon him, and the strange, enervating conviction which had been gaining ground in Tess ever since she had heard his words distinctly was at last established as fact indeed. The preacher was Alec Durberville. And at, and at length the road touched the spot called Cross in Hand. Of all spots on this bleached and desolate upland, this was the most forlorn. 
The place took its name from a stone pillar which stood there, a strange, rude monolith, on which was roughly carved a human hand. Whatever the origin of the relic, there is something sinister or solemn in the scene amid which it stands. D'Urberville said, "'Swear that you will never tempt me by your charms or ways.' Tess, half frightened, gave way to his importunity, placed her hand upon the stone and swore. And the thing that amuses me is people obviously still regard it as a, an enchanted place or a place of luck because they place coins on top of it. Right. Um, th- this is Hardy's map showing the journey from Flint Camash back to Marlott. Um, and then on to Beer Regis. I've marked with some X's on this, these places, to give you um, some ideas. So this is Marlott. Um, this is Flint Camash. Um, that is Torbethays. That is Wellbridge. And this is Beer Regis. Just off the map is Sandbourne. And up that one up there is Boveridge House, or the Slopes. On Lady Day, they took the journey to Beer Regis. You be the woman they call Mrs. Derbyfield, I reckon, he said to Tess's mother, who had remounted. This is Beer Regis Church. Now, the reason I spelt it like this is on Hardy's map, that is how it is spelt, beer. And it reminded me of the fact that Puddletown was called Piddletown, and a suburb of Beer Regis is Shitterton. So they like their names in Dorset in those days. In a quarter of an hour, the old four-poster bed was erected under the south wall of the church, the path of building known as the Durberville Isle, beneath which the huge vaults lay. Over the test of the bedspread was a beautiful traceried window of many lights, its date being 15th century. It was called the Durberville window, and in the upper cart could be discerned heraldic emblems like those of the Durberville's old seal and spoon. Within the window under which the bedstead stood were the tombs of the family, covering in their dates several centuries. She musingly turned to withdraw, passing near an altar tomb on which was a recumbent figure. And if you remember, that recumbent figure turns out to be Alec Durberville. Now, I, the, there are not such tombs in um, Beer Regis Church, and almost certainly Hardy got these from Puddletown. The, the, this is one of the tombs in Puddletown, and Hardy was very familiar with those, and I think he... Tra- transferred that description because obviously it's, it suited the text. Uh, now we jump on a little bit, and uh, this is um, Angel who has come back from Brazil, and he asks the postman, What place is the Herons? A stylish lodging house. Tis all lodging houses here, bless ye. The Herons, though an ordinary villa, stood in its own grounds and was certainly the last place in which one would have expected to find lodgings. And, and, and this is the building that there is good evidence to suggest that Hardy was referring to. And um, you can't really read what it says. Oh, hang on, maybe it's on the next one. No, it does actually say on there, but you can't see it. The house is called Brookside. And an enduring habit of Hardy's is he would name his characters after some of the places in which the events happen. So the house is called Brookside. Hardy describes the landlady of there. Well, it says Mrs. Brooks was a householder at the Herons, which rather does fit with the idea that this is the house. And this, this, is, this again is a picture. That last picture, I think, was 1865. This is, again, a Victorian picture because it overlooks the Pleasure Gardens and the pier at Bournemouth. And... It, in the 1970s, it became the White Hermitage Hotel. It is now the Hermitage Hotel. And this is a photo I took this summer. And you can see on the side there is um, the Herons. And here, here it is close up. So it's still there and, and going, surviving well. Right. We then move on from Sandbourne. It is a 15-mile walk to that old brick building within a wooded glade behind a brook and a bridge. Moyles Court in the parish of Ellingham, northeast of Ringwood. And th- th- this is a prep school these days. It's, the text reads, their footpath which should take them into the depths of the New Forest. And it's actually today part of a long-distance route called the Avon Valley Way, which con- t- conveniently takes you uh, from near Bournemouth to Bramshurst Court and on to Salisbury. The intercepting, the intercepting city, ancient Melchester, which they were obliged to pass through in order to take advantage of the town bridge for crossing a large river, which is the Avon, which obstructed them. And, and that's the, the old bridge there. And obviously, as you know, they went there at night. It was about midnight when they went along the deserted streets, lighted fitfully by the few lamps, keeping off the pavement that it might not echo their footsteps. 
The graceful part of the cathedral architecture rose dimly on their left at hand, but it was lost upon them now. It is Stonehenge, said Claire. And the graphic of Boxing Day, 1891. Something seemed to move on the verge of the dip eastward, a mere dot. It was ahead of a man approaching them from the hollow beyond the sunstone. Claire wished they had gone onward, but in the circumstances decided to remain quiet. The figure, came, the figure came straight towards the circle of pillars in which they were. From the western gate, the highway ascends a long and regular incline, the exact length of a measured mile, leaving the houses gradually behind. This is Wintonchester, where the presence of the immortals ended his sport with Tess. And Wintonchester is Hardy's resurrection of the Saxon name for Winchester. Tess was executed there because Bournemouth until 1974 was in Hampshire, not in Dorset, as most of you know. From the western gate, the highway still climbs the Roman Sarum Road past Winchester Community Prison, as it now is, and the hospital. But the top of the, but the, top of the Great West Hill does not afford the panorama of the city enjoyed by Angel and Lisa Lou, and it's enlightened that it ever did. Their visit, however, is recorded in the fact that as we come up the hill, we have Marnhill Rise, and I don't think that can be a coincidence. And um, that is the end of my talk, really, but just to show you another... Uh, shot from the Polanski film. Okay. So I hope that's given a bit of information. <laughs>